Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Newark NAS. I have some announcements that we want to make uh, right up front here. Uh, in your folders, there is a visitor's card, connect card. If you would take time to fill that out and leave it at the kiosk out here in the foyer. I think part of the reason I'm here is because next Sunday is Connect Cafe. We've been doing this for a number of years. And I want to open this up, especially an invitation to you who are recent attenders here at Newark NAS and have not been to a Connect Cafe. We do it uh, at 10 o'clock, so people come to the 8.30 uh, service uh, and stay for Connect Cafe or come to the cafe and stay for third service. It's a brunch, free, and an opportunity to meet new folks who are also new to the NAS, to learn more about the NAS and how to uh, get connected uh, here at Newark NAS. We invite you to, at the end of this service, walk right out there and uh, go to the uh, kiosk and sign up if you haven't been there before. Life groups here at Newark NAS are a part of who we are. It is an opportunity for us to make connecting with others a part of our life journey. And we would like to have you uh, also go out there to the kiosk or put it on your Connect card this morning to uh, sign up for a life group or at least learn more about life groups. We have a golf scramble coming up. Our fifth annual golf scramble is at 8 a.m. on Saturday, June the 20th at the Raccoon International Golf Course. The cost is $55 per person and includes golf, competition, prizes, and lunch. This is a great opportunity to develop relationships both within Newark NAS and with others outside of the NAS family. We uh, certainly want you to register by going to the kiosk. We also have a yard sale coming up. That's an event uh, to highlight. It's a community lar uh, large uh, yard sale uh, on June 25th at the firehouse. Our food pantry families, uh, young adult foster kids are so, also will be invited. We're looking for household items, outdoor equipment, clothing, toys, furniture in good condition. These items can be dropped off in bins at any of our Newark NAS locations. Thank you in advance for supporting our community through our ministry area. Church, would you stand with me?
is the man who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the man who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. reconciliation, that God was reconciled to the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Because of Christ, we are made new. The old life of sin, worthlessness, and guilt is gone. We can turn our lives towards Christ and have a clean slate. Yeah. 
is alive and his spirit is dwelling inside of us.
Jesus Christ, our Savior, Messiah. Through you, the ultimate sacrifice of grace has been bestowed upon us. Renew our hearts and make us more like you so we can live the Christian lives you called us to live. So we can further build your kingdom. Jesus, thank you for the fresh start. may be seated. I feel like I've been to church. Amen? Right off the top, I want to uh, congratulate our graduating seniors today. Today is kind of, this weekend has kind of been the graduating weekend. There's graduations taking place even later today, and there's a lot of open houses. And so uh, if you are one of those graduating seniors, congratulations. We celebrate you this morning and uh, wish you nothing but the best as you enter into a new season. And we trust that God is going to continue to work and move in your lives uh, as you uh, enter into that new season. Well, for those that may not recognize me, my name, I'm not Scott, uh, to state the obvious. Uh, Scott is, uh, with the end of the school year up at Mount Vernon, uh, Scott is away this weekend enjoying some much needed and much deserved uh, R&R time. I think him and his wife uh, have left and they've gone somewhere, and so uh, we're so thankful for Scott and his ministry and his willingness to journey with us uh, as we... Here at Newark Naz have been in this time of transition for a couple months now. I appreciate Scott's uh, insight into the Word of God and his preaching week in and week out. Uh, my name is Eric Clark, and I'm the, the student community pastor here at Newark Naz for all three locations. And I've said from this platform before, and uh, if you are friends with me, you probably have heard me say uh, enough times that you probably are tired of me saying it, but I love my job. I love the opportunity that I have to journey and walk with students and point them towards Jesus. Uh, and that is done in a variety of ways, but um, I love that, that privilege, and it truly is a privilege. And one of the things that we do often in uh, youth services that we have uh, with our students is I love to have them interacting with, uh, with whoever is speaking. We do that in a uh, variety of ways, but one of the ways that we do that is we ask questions. And we ask the question, and we want them to answer that question for themselves, not for the person that they're sitting next to or you know, mom or dad or whoever it might be, but answer the question for themselves. And we uh, oftentimes might even ask that they kind of yell out their answer, not yell out, but you know, talk out their answer. And, um, you, you always take a risk when you do that because you never know exactly what a student's going to say. So we don't always do that. Uh, one of the ways that we do that, uh, one of the ways we have them interact is I ask a question and then I have them share with the person they're sitting next to. Now, I realize on Sunday morning that is against the rules, but... I, uh, I ask your grace, and uh, we're going we're gonna to actually venture into some new territory this morning. I'm going to ask a question, and I want you to share with the person you're sitting next to. Now, I know that some of you are sitting there thinking, no way, there's, I'm not going to do this. Uh, but it's okay. Uh, if, if you uh, absolutely refuse, that's okay. There's, we're not here to force you. Uh, but we are allowed to talk to each other in church. I don't know if, if that is okay. Uh, and if you're sitting next to somebody that you don't know, extend a hand and tell them your name and introduce yourself. Again, that's okay. Uh, there's going to be a timer up on the screen, and you're gonna, it's going to be a minute. And you only get 30 seconds to answer this question to the person you're sitting next to. And I realize that that is a very short time. Uh, and, the, and the question that I'm going to ask, uh, there's a lot of details that could be shared. And so I would encourage you that you uh, are allowed to talk to that person after church and continue that conversation. Again, that's permitted. We're allowed to do that here at church. Uh, so here's your question. Again, 30 seconds, you're going to talk to the person you're sitting next to. If you're sitting by yourself, uh, you can talk to the person in front of you, maybe scoot down a little bit, whatever, whatever it works. Name a time in your life when you were thankful for a fresh start. Name a time in your life that you were thankful for a fresh start. Go. Switch.
That minute went by fast. In your 30 seconds, I'm sure that you weren't able to totally answer that question. Again, talk to the person after service, that's okay. One of the, uh, recently, uh, about a year ago, I had a falling out with somebody that I was really close with. And uh, after that, uh, I'll just admit to you this morning, we're all friends here, that I, uh, I treated this person pretty ugly for about a year. I, I kind of ignored them, I did pretend, pretended that they weren't around, and uh, it uh, caused some uh, conflict between this person and I. And about three months ago, God began to work on my heart, and he began to convict me and say, hey, you need to deal with this. You need to uh, deal with this ugly side of your life that, that really nobody knows about. And about two weeks ago, I put it off. Uh, I didn't want to, I'll be honest. It was uh, something I didn't really, uh, I don't enjoy those conversations. They're good, they're hard, but uh, I don't always enjoy them. About two weeks ago, I, I asked this person if we could get together, and uh, I had a conversation. And in that conversation, I, I basically asked for forgiveness. I apologized and said, I have, I'm in the wrong in this, and uh, I need to apologize to you. And at the end of that conversation, I asked him if we could start again. So there's my 30 seconds of a time that I have been very thankful for uh, a fresh start. Well, most of us here are familiar with the Staples Easy Button. Now, this one is more than just, uh, check this out. This is really neat. That was easy. Yeah, it talks to you. So kind of cool. Most of you are familiar with that. Staples came out with that very clever uh, kind of campaign quite a few years ago. And they would take usually an office setting that a task uh, or situation that was really difficult. And they would hit this button and then they magically, uh, it would all be really easy. It was a very clever uh, button. There's, but there's been times in my life where I wish there was a reset button or a, a restart button that we could hit and kind of rewind time, maybe a couple minutes prior to, or maybe even days, maybe even years, that we could restart and try again. I have uh, the privilege of getting my two kids off the bus every day from school. And I think we have a picture of my kids. Yeah, there they are. Uh, and that picture uh, describes their personalities more than you know, because uh, my son, uh, he's a handful, and, and Hannah's uh, usually pretty smiley. But uh, my daughter Hannah's nine, she's finishing up fourth grade, and my son Titus there, he started kindergarten this year, and uh, he's six. And I've discovered over this school year that uh, I watch them very, very closely when they get off the bus and they walk into the house. And we have a very short driveway. But in that time, I've learned that I could usually predict how our evening is going to go by simply watching them get off the bus. Let me give you an example. If they get off the bus and they are laughing and giggling and running, running seems to be a big thing. Uh, that is a good indicator that all will be well in the Clark household that evening. There will be laughter and peace and not, we won't have a lot of chaos. However, if they get off the bus and Hannah is in full older, older sibling mode, and for those that are older siblings here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For some reason, I don't know why we do this, but uh, we think that just because they're younger than us, we can treat them as if they're peasants or some type of servant. <laughs> and uh, Hannah, uh, God love her, she has mastered this with her brother. And the opposite is true as well. If Titus is in full-blown younger brother mode, or young, younger sibling mode, and again, if you're a younger sibling here this morning, you know what I'm referring to. You know that uh, you can bring up that one thing and you know how to say, even say it, and you're going to get under the skin of, of your older sibling. And if uh, they're in those modes together, it's, it makes for a very rough evening in the Clark household. A couple weeks ago, they got off the bus, and I could tell right away that it was going to be a rough night. And uh, I was like, oh, no, this is, this is not good. And they got in the house, and it was as if they had bottled up all of their frustration and chaos, and they had saved it graciously for me. And I was so thankful for them. There's a little sarcasm in that. And so they walked in the house, and, it, and this chaos bomb went off. And they had been in the house for about two minutes. And I was ready to go to bed for the night. You know what? <laughs> Have at it. I'm going to bed. Uh, you do whatever you need to do. Obviously, uh, that's not the case. I'm going to get a call from our neighbors. Hey, uh, your son's on the roof. But, um, <laughs> and so I said, hey, we're not going to do this tonight. Uh, we, we got a lot of stuff planned tonight, we're, and we're going to have a good night. And they had already taken their shoes off, and we had started the routine that we have, and they had taken stuff out of their book bags, and I said, hey, put your shoes back on, put everything back in your book bags, and uh, you're going to go to the end of the driveway, and we're going to pretend like you just got off the bus, and we're going to have a, a restart, we're going to reset our evening, and so they did, they went outside, uh, and they, <laughs> it was kind of funny, actually, they, they walked back in, and uh, we had a fairly good evening, it wasn't perfect, but uh, it was, it certainly was better than I think we would have had. Today, I want us to hear and to know that we serve a God that specializes 
and fresh starts. Let me say that again. I want us to hear and to know that we serve a God that specializes in fresh starts. Look at this passage of scripture found in Isaiah 43 with me. It says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. And while that sentence is pretty simple to read, uh, it is unbelievably difficult to live out. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. We serve a God that specializes in fresh starts. Many of you that know me uh, know that I love to hear people's stories. I love to sit down across from somebody and, and uh, hear a little bit about them. And it helps me to know kind of more about them, obviously, but kind of how, who, they, who they are and what they've come through. This morning, I want to share a story with you about an individual that none of us here have actually met before. But I'm confident if we're honest with ourselves, we will be able to identify with the good and the bad of this individual. All right, let me tell you a little bit about our friend. This guy was a hard worker, and he was the type of person that anything that he did, he was 110%. He never did something halfway. He was also the guy, type of guy that loved to take charge. And he did it in a way that wasn't really demanding or you know, people, people enjoyed following him. Uh, he was the leader of the group. He owned his own business. And in his own right, he made it pretty successful. And while he was really business-oriented, he never forgot the value of family. There were moments in his life that he took these amazing, great steps of faith. So much so that his friends that were around him would look and say, Man, if I could just have a glimpse of that, if I could just have part of your faith, uh, I would be so thankful. And our friend was somebody that God had great faith in, so much so that God used him to literally bring thousands of individuals to know Jesus. Now, if you hear a description like that, that's somebody that I can say, hey, I really would kind of want my life to, to model after. There's some elements of that, that that I can relate to. Sounds like a great guy. And while he did have great qualities, he also had an ugly side. He had flaws. In the eyes of the world, his profession wasn't really viewed with much respect. While it was a necessary job, it wasn't a job that people really lined up to be a part of. It didn't take a ton of skill to do his job. He struggled with such things as humility and anger. He was one of the individuals, one of those people that really lived in the now. He struggled with long-term uh, vision. And at times, even though God used him to do amazing things, there were times in his life that in the face of opposition, he struggled to stand up for God. He struggled with emotions such as regret, guilt, depression, shame, maybe even feelings of being completely worthless. Now, I can relate with the good, and I can certainly relate with the ugly. And I think if we're honest, we all could relate to some degree with him. The person that I'm referring to is, is none other than the disciple and apostle Peter. Peter had a lot of great qualities, but there also were things in his life that were pretty ugly. And uh, as you walk through the Gospels, you begin to see uh, his life kind of unfold. And, but we can't ever deny that Jesus, I'm sorry, that Peter wholeheartedly loved Jesus. And I, we're going to point out a couple of stories to kind of prove that point here this morning. But we also can't deny that Jesus wholeheartedly loved Peter, and he believed in him. And he encouraged him, and he knew that uh, Peter was, was an individual that could do amazing things for him in the kingdom. So let's look at Peter and uh, the some of the examples that we can look at to see why, why I say that Peter wholeheartedly loved Jesus. You think of uh, Matthew 4. It was when uh, Peter and Andrew were out fishing. Jesus comes and he says, come follow me. And it says in the scripture that Peter and Andrew immediately dropped their nets, left their business they had worked so hard to build up, and left everything they knew to go and follow Jesus. Now, if you're like me, you, you read that story and sometimes you think, well, it's Jesus. Right? He's standing there, and he's present, and he's saying, hey, come follow me. Of course Peter's going to go. But there's times, other times in the Gospels that we read that Jesus offered that same invitation. And there were, there were people, for a variety of reasons, that uh, turned him down, gave excuses as to why they couldn't go and follow. That wasn't the case with Peter. He immediately went and followed Jesus. You think of the story of, of uh, Jesus walking on the water. And Peter jumped out of the boat and began to walk on the water towards, towards Jesus. And he did that because he always wanted to be close to Jesus. The other disciples thought it was a ghost. And they were scared and they didn't know what to do. But Peter was like, Lord, if it's you, I want to be close to you. 
There's a story in Matthew 16 where Peter declares Jesus as the Christ. And there's times that we might read that story and we might forget the significance of that. Ever since God created the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, if you read the Old Testament, everything is pointing towards the Messiah or the Christ. The sacrifices, the fact of when they were uh, captured and they were taken to different countries, they always were looking for the Messiah to come and save them. And Peter recognized that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah. And in chapter 16 of Matthew, he makes this declaration. Even in times of Peter's lives when he was in the wrong, and I'm not advocating for these next two stories I'm going to give, but even when he was in the wrong, he did them because he was so in love and passionate about Jesus that he uh, wanted to protect him. Shortly after Peter made the declaration of Jesus being the Christ, Jesus began to lay out the path that he was going to have to walk. And he began to talk about how he's going to have to carry his cross. And now for you and I, we have um, rightfully so glorified the cross. It's, the, it's our means of grace of how we can be redeemed back to the Father. It's how Jesus uh, provided that sacrificial lamb. We make necklaces of it. People even have tattoos of the cross. But in that culture... The cross was the, the most ugly and nasty, most torturous way of death. And so any mention of, of the cross was not done with, with a, a good thing in mind. And so when Jesus began to lay that out and that this is what he was going to have to do, Peter, Peter rises up and he says, Lord, never. Never will I allow you to, to go that path. You think of the story in the Garden of Gethsemane when uh, the guard came. I've always been intrigued by this story. I don't know why. But I... Uh, the guard comes to arrest Jesus, and again, Peter rises up, and he says, you're not going to take my guy. You're not going to take my Lord and my Savior, and he chops the ear off the guard. And Jesus responds back and says, hey, listen, that's not how we, that's not what I've taught you. But even when he was wrong, he was trying to protect Jesus. Can't deny that Peter wholeheartedly loved Jesus, and we can't deny that Jesus wholeheartedly loved and believed in Peter. I've always been a, a fan of sports group, played sports when I was younger. Uh, my kids think I'm crazy when I watch sports on TV. I admit to you, uh, I get a little obnoxious, uh, especially in playoff time. I'm a big, uh, well, we won't talk about that, but uh, I've always loved sports. It's not important. We'll move on. And uh, in sports, the first round pick is always a, a big deal. It's the organization's way of saying we are going to sometimes even develop our entire organization around one individual. Or maybe not that extreme, they might just be saying, hey, we uh, need you to be a very large part of what we're doing. And I don't think, I don't think it's coincidence that Peter was, was really the first round pick of Jesus and when it came to his disciples. Jesus was saying, hey, Peter, we're going to put together a team of 11 other guys, and they're going to do, they're all going to be great, and they're all going to have different qualities that we need. But I need you to be the leader. I need you to be the one when there's, when there's problems or questions, they're all going to look to you. I need you to be that guy. And Peter was the first really disciple that Jesus picked. In Matthew 16, there's a lot happening in that chapter. I keep referencing it. You might uh, want to take a look at it. There's a lot going on. But Jesus declared Peter to be the rock that he was going to build the church upon. There is no greater responsibility that Jesus could give somebody than that right there. I'm going to build, basically build my church on, on you. And uh, we also look at... In Acts, and we find that Jesus trusted Peter to be the first person to preach a sermon after he ascended. I had never really thought about this until preparing for this morning, but think, with this, think about this with me for just a second. Jesus had been with these individuals, with the disciples and all the other followers that he had for three years, and they'd seen him do uh, some amazing things. Jesus taught with authority that no one had ever witnessed before. And then towards the last part of his earthly ministry, they see him get arrested, beaten, crucified. And then put on a cross and he was dead. They buried him. Three days later, Jesus rises from the dead. He's back with nail-pierced hands. He makes the appearances to the disciples. He's with them for a short time. And, and then they see him ascend into heaven. And then we talked last week about Pentecost and how they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine this roller coaster that the disciples were on and followers? And who did Jesus trust? To kind of bring that chaos back into order. It was Peter. Peter, I need you to be the one that people are going to follow. They're going to look at. Not that we follow Peter, but I need you to be the one that brings chaos. I need you to bring order to chaos. I need you to be the one to be my spokesperson when I'm not here. Jesus entrusted Peter quite a bit. 
In many ways, Peter was saying, Lord, you're, Jesus, you're my Lord, you're my Savior, you're the one I'm going to follow to the end of the world. And Peter, I'm sorry, Jesus was saying, Peter, you're my guy. You're my right-hand man. You're the one that I'm going to lean on. Life for the disciple Peter was, had its bumps for sure. When we read the Gospels, we, we can't deny that Peter messed up at times in his life. But for the most part, life was pretty, pretty smooth for him. And then the Garden of Gethsemane happens. And Peter's life is completely flipped upside down. We read the story of the Garden of Gethsemane, and uh, we, we know that just right before that, the disciples and Jesus were gathered in the upper room, and they had just done the, the Lord's uh, Supper. And there are some awesome instructions that we can read about in John 14 through really 17 uh, of Jesus instructing, giving instructions to the disciples. They had this kind of mini retreat. And then they come back, and Jesus knows what lays ahead of them. And uh, he says, when they get in the garden, I need to go pray. I need to go seek the Father by myself. So you guys stay here and pray, and I'm going to go over here by myself for a little while, and I'm, going to, I'm just going to pray. And he comes back, and all the disciples are asleep. Oops. And while Jesus, I'm sure, was frustrated and disappointed with all the disciples, it was Peter that he pointed out to. He, pointed, he singled him out and said, Peter, not even you? Not even you could stay awake for an hour and pray with me? Shortly after that, we've already referenced this story, the guards come and they come to arrest Jesus. And Peter, in his love and passion for Jesus, he rises up and he chops the ear off, off the guard. And Jesus rebukes him and he says, Peter, you're responding out of anger and hate towards this individual. I've taught you to love and forgive and have compassion. And then a couple hours following is the very familiar story of Peter denying Jesus three times when people confront him. Not even just not being a disciple of Jesus, but even knowing who Jesus was. Jesus, I'm sorry, Peter went from being the head of the disciples to being someone that lacked in their prayer life. Peter went from being the head of the disciples to being somebody that responded with such rage and hate, something that Jesus spoke adamantly against. Peter went from being the head of the disciples to being somebody, if we're honest, uh, went to, and he became really kind of a coward. In the face of opposition. You want to talk about a mountaintop experience, going from a mountaintop experience to being in the valley. So much in the valley that he probably just wanted to find a rock and crawl in and, and kind of disappear for a while. And as a result of all of this, uh, after the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter believes that he, that he has no worth anymore. How could Jesus use him after Jesus believed in him and trusted him and talked to him so much about being the leader. He's supposed to be the one that the church built upon, and he, he refused to even know who he was when he was faced, and when people confronted him. So how could, how, could, how could Peter be used? If you fast forward to John 21, we read the story. Jesus has been crucified, he's been buried, he's been resurrected. He's had uh, appearances, appearances with the other disciples, but he's not had any interaction with Peter yet. And there's this beautiful story of, of Peter, he's out fishing, which indicates that not only did he, have, did he lose faith in the fact that, that Jesus may be able to use him to build the church, but he'd gone back to his old way of living. He was a fisherman of men, and he went back to just being a fisherman. And we have this beautiful story of, of Jesus being on the shore, and Peter recognizes that it's him, and he jumps out of the boat, and he swims, and they have this embrace, this, this coming back to Jesus moment. The story I want to read uh, this morning is found in John chapter 21, 15 through 19. And it uh, happens right after this happened where they kind of embrace, they have breakfast together. And it says this in, in verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked the third time, do you love me? Peter responds, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourselves and went where you wanted, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you 
do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And this is the final sentence here that I want to focus on. Then Jesus said to Peter, follow me. Peter, I don't, I haven't forgot. I haven't forgot all the good things we've been through. I've been, I haven't forgot the fact that just a couple weeks ago, a couple days ago, that you, you responded with such rage and anger towards somebody. I haven't forgot that you denied even knowing me. I haven't forgot that you returned to your old way of living. But you know what, Peter? Follow me. There aren't a lot of hoops you have to jump through. There's no class that you have to attend. Follow me. I realize that the majority of my ministry experience has been with students. And I can't tell you the number of times that, that I've sat across from a student and for a variety of reasons, uh, they have uh, this look of shame or regret or guilt. They were defeated. And they've talked about how they've, they've had the same posture that, that Peter had. Eric, you have no idea what I've done. You have no idea uh, the amount of times that I've, I've told God, God, I'm not going to go back to that. I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to respond that way, whatever the case might be. And time and time again, I have let God down. There's no way God could love me. There's no way God could forgive me. And while that situation, those, that example is, is said knowing of sitting across from a student, I think it's pretty safe to say that here today there may be somebody that has the same posture as Peter and the same posture as those students I just described as distraught, dejected, and defeated. Earlier today I, I said that I wanted you to hear and to know that we serve a God that specializes in fresh starts. Let me add one more thing to that. I want us to hear it, I want us to know it, but some of us might need to experience it this morning. There's a psalm in, the chap in chapter 51 that says this, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. I love this next verse. Do not banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. Powerful, powerful verses. Let me close with this illustration. A couple weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago now, we asked our students a question. Surprise, surprise, right? <laughs> we asked the question for those that could answer the question. Before you knew Jesus as your personal Savior, give us three descriptive words of how you viewed yourself. And again, we, re we reiterated the fact that we're not asking, hey, how does... Uh, how do I view you? Or how does mom and dad view you? Not how does your coach view you, your teacher? How, do you, how did you view yourself before having a relationship with Jesus? And the answers were, were heartbreaking for sure, but they were also very enlightening. We, these are just a, a handful of the answers that we received back that day. The biggest answer, the number one answer that we got back was I was very selfish. They also said that they were fearful that they were anxious, that they were lustful, that they were arrogant. The second biggest answer that we got back was, I lack self-confidence. I was prideful, I was addicted, I was attention-seeking. There, there have been moments in my life that I can identify with just about every one of those. And I would bet that some of us here today struggle with those same things. We asked a follow-up question to that. For those that could answer, if you have a relationship with Jesus, because we have plenty of students that don't, and we, we know that, we love them, and we continue to journey with them. But for those that can answer the question, how do you view yourself now that you have a relationship with Christ? And this list is exciting. This is the list that, that I love. Here's, a, here's some answers. I'm more forgiving to others. I'm more faithful. I'm patient. I'm loving. There's this willingness to serve others because of what, how Jesus has served us. And my favorite answer is I am forgiven. The same grace and restoration that Jesus offered Peter along the seashore is available to you and I today. But let me end this time with a question. 
Start with a question, end with a question. Do you need a fresh start today? Do you need to come to Jesus and just say, Jesus, I'm sorry, let's start over. Let's hit the reset button and begin this again. As Kenny and the band come and lead us in a time of, of worship as we kind of draw close to Jesus. If there's someone here today that, that wants to, to pray at the altar, you're more than welcome to come. If you want somebody to pray with you, I would encourage you to come to the, the here in the front. If you need to pray and you just want to spend some time with Jesus and you don't want anybody bothering you, uh, I would encourage you to go to the sides. In our closing time today, I would just encourage us to be very honest and open. Do we need a fresh start with Jesus? Can I pray for you? Jesus, I am so thankful for this opportunity to, to stand before your people, your children, and give this reminder that you are a God of fresh starts. God, I pray in my own life that as I seek you, I'm always, always mindful of that. Lord, if there's someone here today that needs, needs a fresh start, I encourage them to, to take that first step, and you'll be faithful to meet them halfway. God, we love you today, and we, we need you as we seek you this morning. It's in your name I pray. Amen. times I fail, still your mercy remains. Should I stumble again, still I'm God in your grace. Everlasting, your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory
soul I give you control Consume me from the inside out Lord Let justice and praise Become my embrace To love you from the inside Uh, you may be seated for a moment. And if these would need to continue praying, that's totally fine as well. I apologize for my voice. Um, Bill Weaver uh, in the first service said he would be here to back me up, but I don't even see him right now. No, we communicated. He's okay. I want to say, though, how much I appreciated the services that we've already had today. Kenny, you've done such a superb job. I really appreciate him. He's an intern. He sure doesn't act like an intern. He acts like he's been doing it a long time. And uh, the message, the theme of today, clean slate, new starts. Uh, what a great future you have. And it's all because, can you sense how he allows God to just flow through him and just really be the center of what he does? I appreciate that. And then um, I want to say something about Eric Clark this morning, if I could. Um, Eric, I had the privilege of being a part of the team that hired him when uh, we were together in our last assignment. And uh, he was a great, great youth leader then as he is now. But in those days, he really didn't uh, take opportunity to do the speaking from the platform in a main service. And so to watch that happen since he's been here has been so rewarding. He has just developed in such a beautiful way. And uh, I'm proud, just to be honest about it. <clears throat> but um, thank you, Eric, for the wonderful message again today. I uh, met with the district superintendent and the church board Wednesday night, and they asked that I share what I shared with them, uh, with you today. So uh, I'm going to just read what, uh, uh, what I uh, shared with them just in a summed up fashion. And so it is not at all uncommon for someone in ministry to experience seasons during their spiritual journey. Cheryl and I have been in a season of ministry here at Newark Nazarene. What a wonderful time of watching God work in the lives of his people these nearly six years. It's a bittersweet moment for us to share this morning that we will begin a new season of ministry in Indianapolis, Indiana sometime in August. During our 38 years of full-time ministry, we have not made a practice of seeking out a place to serve, but rather relying on God to open doors in his timing. Once again, God has decided there's another challenge for me 
a 61-year-old guy. Can you believe that? Well, I love the thought that Newark Naz will be an extension of this ministry as we take the things that we have learned while here and apply them to our new assignment in Indianapolis. One of the benefits of this move is that we will get to be close to our son and his wife and, of course, our grandkids. I am confident of this one thing. God is at work here at Newark Naz. And uh, if you just think for a moment, pause and give thought to that, you would know it's true. Be patient and faithful during this time of transition. And remember this one thought. God is never early. He's never late. He's right on time. And the person that's coming here to lead you will be the right person at the right time. God bless you all. Let's stand together. I hope you have a great Sunday afternoon. You are dismissed.